Children, let me ask you a question, because I haven't done this in a while. Have any of you been to an amusement park recently at all? Anybody been to an amusement park? Not this summer, not last summer. Y'all need to get out more. <laughs> Jaden, you been to the amusement park? Jaden, like, I don't know. Oh, you went, to, you went there in Hawaii? Was it fun? Did they let you in? Okay, I just make sure that they let you in. Okay. Um, if you've been to an amusement park ever in your life, you know how fun it is. And you especially, like when I would go to the amusement parks near where I grew up, um, in the Philadelphia area, whether it was in um, Allentown, we went to Dorney Park, or we went to a place called West Point Park. Um, Reverend Vogel knows about those. He grew up in Lancaster County, and of course it was Hershey Park. Um, and then also near me in Jersey was Great Adventure. Great Adventure was one of the first Six Flags amusement parks. And one of the fun things that happened is you would ride by it, or you were going up toward it, you would begin to see the roller coaster, right? You ever see that? And you would see the roller coaster and you begin to hear some of the rides and you get closer and closer, right? And then you would hear um, folks on the ride screaming. You would know that they were having fun and you were like getting ready to get into it because you were about to do that same thing, right? Now, I want you to imagine children, especially you children. I want you to imagine something. Imagine this. There's a new amusement park that's opening right here in Elk Grove or South Sacramento. And they're gonna put it so close to you that you're gonna ride by it like almost every day. And you're gonna see it on TV and you're gonna be looking forward to going and having fun there, right? But then your father tells you, you can't go to Fun Town because Fun Town's not open to black people. Our series title is The Content of His Character. I'm sure some of you remember or perhaps have made the connection that that's a line, a very famous line that Dr. King once uttered. He said that I want my children to be judged by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. The context for that was there was a new amusement park opening near where he lived. And an advertisement came on for that park. And his daughter was just giddy with excitement to go. And then he had to tell her, Funtown is not open to black people. And he recalls seeing the tears well up in her eyes. And he remembers how he and she felt that intense sense of brokenness. That simply because they were black people in America, there were vast aspects of this society that they could not access. They experienced an aspect of what it means to be poor in spirit, that there's a life that you want, that you want to experience, but that you simply do not have, quote unquote, what it takes. And in the 1960s, within my lifetime, that meant you didn't have the quote unquote right color of skin. To be poor in spirit is to realize that you do not have what it takes to secure the rich, full, satisfying life of peace, joy, meaning, identity, purpose, and contentment that we all want. You come to the realization that despite all of your efforts, that you just don't have it. Now let me give a quick recap of our sermon series the content of his character. We, we said a couple of weeks ago 
that it is a sermon. That is, it's a loving, authoritative direction for our lives. Again, we preach sermons to our children almost every day. We give our children loving, grace-filled, authoritative direction for their lives. That's what a sermon is. We also noted that the sermon spells out what it means, what it means when we claim to believe in Jesus Christ. To say that I believe in Christ is to embrace the character of Christ for my life. If I don't embrace the character of Christ for my life, that's written right out here, spelled out here in black and white and plain English, I've got to question that profession. It means that when we claim to believe in Jesus Christ, that this is what we mean, that we follow him in this character. Also, this sermon will consistently preach Christ's unique supremacy to us and to those around us. We will find in this sermon, there are going to be literally lines in this sermon where we are brought face to face with the unique deity and supremacy of Jesus Christ. It will be unmistakable. And fourthly, it is extraordinarily relevant to our lives. Trust me, as I said when I, in the introduction of this sermon, the, these, this sermon, these passages are extraordinarily relevant to your life, to our families, to our community. We will live in these incredible pronouncements of Christ-saturated life and faith, or we will live according to the dictates of our own hearts in this world. Look at it this way. Take some time this week to read through the Beatitudes and pray, asking that the Lord will put them to work in your home, your life, your extended family. They are incredibly relevant to the lives we live in the here or now, in the here and now. One more thing we noted is that one of the major themes of this sermon is the kingdom of heaven. And over and over and over again, especially in this gospel, the Lord mentions the kingdom of heaven. It's one of the major themes. We define the kingdom of heaven, heaven as the reign and rule of the living God, as expressed in his word and creative order, fulfilled by the person, ministry, character, teaching, and cross of his son, Jesus Christ, and then embodied by his people so that we can apply it to our community. The kingdom of God is not some esoteric, ephemeral, pie in the sky, angels on clouds, somewhere up there, out there, in some distant, unknown future. It is here and now, present in Jesus Christ, lived out through his people for the glory of God and the furtherance of our witness. The Beatitudes, these particular sayings that begin the Sermon on the Mount, they spell out some of the essential aspects of Christ's character to those of us who claim to follow him as we seek to embrace him in a way that shapes our own character. Essentially, the Beatitudes get to the heart. Listen, they get to the heart of our identity. They help us to answer the question who we are as individuals and who we are as a group of people who claim to believe and follow Jesus Christ. And as we can see, the Beatitudes follow a unique structure. Christ first pronounces a blessing. We'll get into that in a moment. He says, blessed. We, we just saw that. Jaden read it. And then he gives a particular character quality. Sometimes it's more of an, an innate, intrinsic character quality that is, these people are marked by this. 
Sometimes it's what they do. So blessed are the poor in spirit. It talks about sort of an, an intrinsic, an innate character quality. And then sometimes it's what they do. Blessed are the merciful. Speaking of, an, again, that innate character quality that works out in particular actions. And then it concludes with what is the blessing? What exactly is the blessing that is given, for example, to the poor in spirit? So we have these eternal, internal character qualities flowing directly from Christ into our lives that have consequences in the external actions concerning the way we live. They flow from a faith in Christ that leads us to embrace and embody these qualities and then actively witnessing, using them in our lives of Christ, his cross, and his kingdom. If I can get one amen, that would help us to move along. Thank you. One more thing. Interesting thing about this particular sermon. I, and again, I, I could not find this in the commentary. So if you think I'm off, that's all right. That's cool. I really believe that this entire sermon, that part of the con contextual backdrop, is the dead religion that Jesus grew up with. I believe that Jesus, when he preached this sermon, that one of the things that was on his heart and mind was the religious system that was centered in people using God simply to grab power, notoriety, and wealth for themselves at the expense of others. That Jesus, as I said in the first message, he is literally deconstructing, but he's not deconstructing the law. He's deconstructing the corrupted way that those who were teaching the law had represented or misrepresented the living God. For example, we're going to get to this particular passage soon, but Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, what's interestingly enough, we know where love your neighbor comes from. It comes from Leviticus 19. Now, when we get to that passage, you'll find nothing in that passage that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. So here's the question. Well, who said that part? Why did they connect it with Leviticus 19? What were they trying to get at? You see, Jesus grew up with a corrupted, dysfunctional, sinful way of how people taught others to look at the living God. And I believe this particular sermon is a contrast to that. Again, we'll, we'll see that as we work through it. All right, let's get to this particular verse. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessing in this context conveys the idea of being especially favored. Now, in general, there are a few words in the New Testament used for the word blessed, one of which we get the word eulogy from. It is to speak well of. That's the word that's used in Ephesians 1, where Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, in the heavenlies in Christ. He said, speak well of. That's why I say we, what we want to do as the people of God is we want to speak well of the Lord to ourselves, to those around us, to those close to us. But that's not this word. This word conveys the idea of being especially favored. It particularly speaks of those who are especially favored because they receive divine favor. Again, it's a word that speaks of the idea of being particularly favored and therefore of being blessed, happy, or privileged because they have received a measure of divine favor. One way we can look at it is this way. Christ, when he says blessed, he says those who enjoy God's full favor, listen carefully, those who enjoy God's full favor with all of his privileges and benefits. 
blessed that is. Here's a pronouncement that Jesus Christ has said that favored, blessed, happy, privileged are those who are under and by grace the full favor of the living God with all of its privileges and benefits. Now we know that that blessing doesn't mean that life comes apart from trouble. In fact, as we'll find, especially in the Beatitudes, those who are blessed endure and can endure a significant amount of trouble and of harshness and of hardship in our lives. It means we will have sadness and setbacks and challenges. In fact, I'd say that part of our blessing is the fact that we can still, and listen, we can still enjoy a rich, fulfilled, contented, peace-filled, joyful life, even as we wade through the harsh difficulties of what life throws at us. So, bless it. Now again, to be poor in spirit is to come to the knowledge and the realization that we don't have it. There is, I believe, a connotation that Jesus is talking about also the physically poor in his day. Those who were com literally completely, utterly dependent upon others simply to survive. To be poor in spirit is to come to the place where we realize that on our own, we just don't have it. That there is a life out there, that there is literally a hole in our soul, and we cannot fill it on our own despite our best efforts. And sometimes you literally see it in the face of a child whose eyes fills with tears when she realizes she is cut out of a whole society just because she's black. That there is a brokenness of spirit that wonders, why can't I get that? Brokenness and being poor in spirit, we realize that the life that we want the rest, the contentment, the peace, the joy, the satisfaction, the identity, the redemption we want, that we cannot get it on our own. We are poor in spirit. We don't have it. But it's not just happening. It doesn't just happen to those who are, and there are many in our society still, who are indeed downtrodden. There are many in our society still today. They may not be barred from things because of the color of their skin, but our brother Ryan, was, he was talking with, with Chris, and he spoke about some of his students who literally can't get to work because the society, our city, Sacramento, our county, Sacramento, they have made it so and I don't know if anybody from SAC is hearing this, but if you are, I'm Lance Lewis. There you go. So they've made it so that you cannot easily get to Delta Shores via public transportation. That they would have to walk several miles just for a job at Walmart. That's what it means to be poor in spirit. That means what it means to be living in a society where there are those who say you simply you don't count as much as others. And therefore, they're told in so many ways that you are poor in spirit, that you can't access aspects of this society. But also, it can happen to people who have accessed everything in this society in an extraordinary manner. A few weeks ago, I told you about a man that I can't, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly, so I'm going to ask forgiveness on that. His name um, is Mo Gadot. I believe he's from Egyptian descent. Let me read something about Brother Mo that just fascinating. And please listen carefully, because we have to understand that being poor in spirit 
goes beyond just a brokenness that happens when you can't access the society, but it goes deeper into a spiritual level where you realize that you can have everything you want and still have nothing. In his late 20s, Mogadot had reached what most, this is from an article written about him, I believe, on MSNBC, but I'm not positive about that, had reached what most everyone in our society and world would consider the peak of success and happiness. Check this out. In his late 20s, Mogadot had reached what most everyone in our society and world would consider the peak of success and happiness. At a high point of his success, Gadot says he had a handsome salary. That was, he, he was he rolling in it. That's how we say it. I don't know if they still use that slang because I'm 59, but he had a handsome salary. Now, the reason he had a handsome salary is because he was actually the director of Google X. Google X was a division of Google that basically said, here's a whole lot of money. Shoot for the moon. Literally, just dream up whatever product you think would work and try to get it to work for the betterment of our company. And so he directed that division. So he had a handsome salary. He had two company cars, a massive villa. I can't even conceive in my mind what a massive villa would look like. But whatever a massive villa looks like, that's what he had with a swimming pool. He traveled first class. It was incredible, he says. He was living in Dubai at the time and also had a day trading side gig. And this is what he said. I made double digit returns every single month of my life, right? And you know, with my math skills, I developed my own little algorithm and I made a ton of money. Market going up going down i was just making money non-stop can we let that sink in and does this brother tie he already had a handsome salary from google he then had a side gig in which he says by his own words i was making money non-stop and I had a massive villa in Dubai. Do you have any idea of how much it would cost to have a massive villa in Dubai? We ain't talking El Grove or Sacramento, maybe even San Francisco. Dubai expensive, y'all. I'm gonna read that last part again and then one more line. Market going up, going down, I was just making money non-stop. And I wasn't happy. How in thee are you gonna be head of perhaps the most innovative division of one of the most innovative companies that have ever existed. And after work, I guess maybe it was remote, I don't know. You go out to your pool from your massive villa in Dubai. After logging off your computer where you have made more nonstop money and you are not happy. It goes on. One night, he even bought two vintage Rolls Royces online. Why? Because I could. And listen to this carefully. And because I was desperately trying to fill the hole in my soul. Said Godot in his 27 2017 book, Solve for Happy, Engineer Your Path to Joy. Kadat goes on. You won't be surprised to hear that when those beautiful classics of English automotive styling arrived at the curb, they didn't lift my mood one bit.
I'm, I'm done. Because growing up, if someone could stay to, to, to eight, 15, 16, 21-year-old Lance, imagine the life that you would have to have to be happy. I would say I'm working for an amazing company that I lead, doing amazing stuff with a handsome salary. Basically, I'm rolling in it. I have discovered a way apart from that to make even more and more money to the point where I literally am making it nonstop. I have a phenomenal house in an exotic location with a grand pool. I've got two Rolls Royces that I don't need. I think if I got all of that, if, if that was it, yes, then, then I would be happy. He wasn't. Like most people who have success early in their careers, the more you get blessed in life, somehow you start to become more unhappy, Gadot said. It really puzzled me because the events of my life were amazing in my late 20s. And I was miserable. This man had done every single thing. His society, our society, and our world tells you to do. Go live the life that you want, doing exactly what you want, the way you want, doing it to the limit, making all the money you want, having all the prestige you want, having all the significance you want, having all the toys you want, and then you will be happy. And yet he says he got it, he did it, it happened in his late 20s, and he was miserable. He was poor in spirit. He realized that not all of his prowess, his ingenuity, his money, not all of his achievement, his fame, his notoriety could bring him that measure that would finally cure and fill that hole in his soul. To be poor in spirit means that we realize that we don't have it. That there is something out there because we are people created in God's image. And that our society with all of its wealth and power and privilege can never give it to us. We can do anything and everything we think we could and should do to achieve that measure finally of some sense of satisfaction. And yet doing it apart from God means that once we get it all done, do it exactly the way we want to do it, that in the recesses of our souls, as we think through it in our minds, as we sit down after doing the, the last thing that we thought we should do, and we did it apart from God, we're still miserable. This, this is despair. Because what else do you do when you've done everything you were told to do that everybody said you should do? You've done it. You've done it to the nth degree, and it still doesn't matter. To be poor in spirit is to come to the realization that you don't have it. But that thankfully someone does. Now, Jesus picks up on this, and we've already defined the kingdom of heaven. And interestingly enough, one of the things Jesus will do is he will use this particular phrase twice in the Beatitudes. As we said, the kingdom of heaven is the rule and reign of the living God as expressed in his word in creative order, fulfilled in the person, work, ministry, teaching cross of Jesus Christ and then embodied by his people as we apply it in our lives to our community. And the first, listen, the first aspect of that kingdom of heaven is that the living God says, I want to connect with you because I made you. I know you. I love you. And I realize that you will never, ever, ever be completely fulfilled in this life only. 
that the only way that you will have that rest and peace and joy and fulfillment and identity and meaning and purpose is with and through me. But here's the deal. One of the other aspects of being poor in spirit realizes that there's nothing that we can do on our own to seal that connection. That we on our own would never be good enough. We just won't be. It is what it is. We simply can never live up to the measure of what Christ said. We, we'll read through, again, the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll figure that out right quick when he says, you must be perfect that your heavenly Father in, in, in heaven is perfect. And we'll go, oh, go yo, hold it, hold, 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 hold up. I messed up this morning. I got an attitude this morning with Sharon. So I'm disqualified. You see, one of the biggest challenges we know of those who may struggle with poverty is the constant bear of debt. Because many of us say, man, we middle class and we struggling with the constant bear of debt. That it always seems that you're indebted to somebody for something. To be poor in spirit, it realizes that we're indebted to God because of our own disobedience and sin. That we, those created in his image, in our seeking for fulfillment, are seeking for significance, are seeking for satisfaction, we have done so apart from a worshiping relationship with him. And in so doing, we have incurred a debt. But we're blessed because one of the first aspects of the kingdom of heaven is that aspect in which the living God connects with us. And here's where Jesus begins to bring us in, as it were, behind the curtain. Because he is the one who became poor in spirit for us. He is the one who established a perfect, permanent, right standing by the way he lived. He, he said it himself. He fulfilled the law. He said it right in this particular sermon. We'll get to it soon. He did everything God requires anyone to do to have a perfect, permanent, right standing before the living God. He did it, but he's the only one who has done it. We have never done it, and we could never do it on our own. He did. And then yet, he becomes as one who didn't. He becomes as the one who has a debt so heavy, so weighty, so much that the only way the father has to discharge that debt is by putting him on the cross and crucifying him. He took the punishment. He took the ultimate sacrifice to pay the debt that we owe. He the one who embodies the riches of heaven, he became poor for us. And so having lived a perfect, permanent, I mean, a perfect, right, right, righteous life and established a perfect, permanent, right standing before the living God, he then goes and he takes all of our debt. And on the cross, he discharged it all. And he gives of those and only those who place their faith in Christ, that perfect permanent right standing and that written notice that your debt has been canceled fully, finally, completely, eternally. So that you can take advantage of the very first aspect of this kingdom of heaven, which is a right relationship with the living God so that he can then fill us with himself. And we can finally know and see, wow, I have it. I didn't earn it. Amen. Go ahead and clap. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. I could not have gotten it on my own. In fact, things that I did on my own to get it disqualified me for it. And yet by his grace, by his love, by his power, the rich 
son of the living God, became poor for my sake and then gave it to me as a free gift. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the rule and the reign of God, beginning with a right relationship and a right connection to the living God that fills our lives with his peace, power, presence, with his significance, contentment, forgiveness of sins, and joy. 